All right, hi everyone, thanks for sticking around. Everyone still awake? Doing well? Yeah, no? Okay, um, so the name of the session officially is um, how did we get here? Uh, and in parentheses, galaxy evolution. And I'll confess from the beginning that I'm not going to talk about galaxy evolution at all, uh, but I will try to talk about how we got here in the sense of uh, sort of large scale structure formation and how the largest things in the universe grow, and these are clusters of galaxies. So I'm going to talk about the properties near the edges of clusters of galaxies, uh, and that's the motivation for my title, just in case you were confused about that before. Okay, uh, so like I said, let me start with the largest structures. We've all seen this picture. This is the Millennium Simulation. The question I want to ask is how much of the cosmic web do we actually see? And I'm sure you're aware that the answer to that question is, uh, you know, it's just the tip of the iceberg. But actually what I want to say is we only see the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg, okay? Because obviously most of this stuff is dark matter, but it's not just about that. We also, uh, galaxies actually, you can see them tracing the entire cosmic web, but most of the baryons in the universe aren't in the form of galaxies, they're in the form of hot X-ray emitting gas. So about 85 to 90% of the baryons are in, in this hot X-ray emitting gas. Uh, this gas is diffuse, it has a very low surface brightness, it's very hard to see, and so we really, in this X-ray emitting gas, we only see the very, very centers of these, the very tips of these icebergs. So here is the tip of uh, the most famous iceberg. This is the core of the Perseus cluster. Um, this is an image with Chandra. You can see beautiful structure. There's lots of physics encoded in this image, which I'm sure most of you have seen many times. Uh, and so now let's look at the entire X-ray iceberg. Uh, so if this were, uh, suppose that this were the, uh, the uh, X-ray iceberg that is the Perseus cluster, uh, and if this is the yellow thing is the size of the virialized region of the in the Perseus cluster, uh, then the image that I just showed you before with all this nice and rich detail uh, is about that big. Um, okay, that is the scale. Now, clearly I'm being very unfair here and trying to impress you uh, because the limitation in the case of the Perseus cluster isn't the fact that we can't see further out, it's just that Perseus is so close, kind of in our face, that it's a limitation of the size of uh, the field of view of, of X-ray um, telescopes. However, we are limited in how far we can see the X-ray gas in these, uh, in these systems. Uh, and we're limited by, uh, or we were limited by the background. Uh, and we were limited to about this green circle over here. Uh, and so with uh, XLM, Newton, and Chandra, we really couldn't see uh, all of this remaining yellow area over here because the backgrounds were too high. We weren't able to measure the temperature and the entropy and the pressure of the gas out there. And uh, so if you take the volume of the green sphere divided by the volume of the yellow sphere, you come out with the fact that we are actually missing uh, about 70% of the cluster volume. We are missing thermodynamic information about, uh, about that part. Um, so, you know, in, uh, actually you can do two different things about that more recently. One thing you can do is you can use uh, the Suzaku satellite, which has a lower background, uh, and you can try to push further into this regime and try to measure um, the, uh, the temperature from X-ray spectra. The other thing you can do, which has been done, is to use um, SZ experiments such as Planck. Uh, and that won't, that, that'll basically just give you uh, the pressure. So that's an extra information about the thermodynamics of, of these bits. Uh, so I'm gonna focus on Suzaku results, um, namely all of these or some of these. Uh, so these are all um, key or large projects with Suzaku, and you are looking at about a megasecond each on the nearest, brightest clusters. And the reason that we pick these systems is because they're very nearby, and that means that the point spread function of Suzaku, which isn't amazing, uh, actually doesn't hurt us as much as it would if we were looking at a higher redshift. Um, and again, the yellow uh, circles show you uh, the virial radius of all of these systems. Uh, the Virgo cluster is a very recent observation. We just got these last 
pointings last week, so I'm not going to talk about that, but I will tell you something about uh, Perseus and the coma clusters. Uh, so fortunately, uh, there are two sides, there are always two sides of, of each coin, right? Uh, so uh, the fact that it's nearby um, uh, for Perseus allows us to see it with a much better spatial resolution, despite the bad PSF of Suzaku. Uh, however, it also means that, well, each of these little things is a Suzaku field of view. This is really a lot of observing time, and it's really impossible to cover the entire area uh, that we would like to cover, so this, the, the inside of this entire circle. Uh, however, we do have a very in, uh, interesting complementary data set, uh, which is from uh, ROSAT. This is very old data from about uh, 20, 25 years ago. Um, and the uh, ROSAT has a bigger field of view, so we can uh, cover a much a bigger fraction of this area. Um, however, it doesn't really have the energy band that would allow us to measure the temperature very accurately. So these two data sets are in a sense complementary. Uh, so here's one of the first results uh, that we got by basically combining these two data sets. Uh, so here's what happens um, on this side. Here's what happens if you subtract a radial average from the surface brightness uh, that you would see with uh, ROSAT, um, and so you see these very interesting features over here, the surface brightness excesses. And lacking the, the, uh, the Suzaku data that we have right now, you could not really interpret these and you could not say what are these features actually about, but now we have thermodynamic information so we know what is the temperature uh, and we can tell that wherever you have the surface brightness excesses, the temperature is actually low. Okay, so these are uh, bright, high density, low temperature features. And we actually know such features um, in the cluster cores and they're called cold fronts. Uh, and this is a, a numerical simulation that shows the production of such a cold front. And essentially what you do is you take your cluster and you throw in a little subcluster and that makes the, the gas in the main cluster to sort of swirl around. Um, and produce such surface brightness features. And they're exactly what you expect. They are low temperature, high surface brightness features. Uh, so this is kind of exactly the same thing with one exception. Uh, here we go out to a radius of about 400 kiloparsec in the simulation. This is more of a central region type of thing. While here, these features go out to something like um, a bit over a megaparsec. So this is much larger scales than what simulators have seen so far. And in fact, this, uh, if we look at XMM Newton, uh, an XMM Newton mosaic of the same region, you see that these, this kind of uh, uh, spiral or these features continue into the cluster core. So you see a coherent structure uh, going from about 10 kiloparsec out to over a megaparsec, so two orders of magnitude um, in radius. And that's very interesting because uh, I'm going to put this question out and I don't have an answer for it, but does this, the fact that this structure remains coherent over two orders of magnitude in radius, does this imply anything about ICM viscosity? And I, I will be very happy if numerical simulators could help me out on this one. It could be bigger, but it couldn't be smaller, right? Um, okay, uh, so I just want to give a thumbs up to Jack uh, for this very nice tidbit on the Kaipak webpage from some time ago about this. Uh, and I really love the title because I think uh, if you think about you know, this thing as a cosmic blender, uh, then you'll really remember uh, the results very easily in the future. Okay, but I promised to go out to the virial radius of the Perseus cluster, and I haven't done that yet, so let me go out to even larger radii. And what I'm showing here is um, entropy profiles um, along, so we have eight different arms observed with Suzaku, so these are eight different directions, and they're divided basically on whether they go through the eastern cold front, uh, that we saw in the previous picture, whether they go to this uh, surface brightness, 
brightness excess at even larger radii or whether they go through neither of these features. Um, and here is uh, the, the power law is basically the expectation for the entropy. So we expect f uh, the, the entropy just from semi-analytic uh, arguments uh, in the absence of any other kind of, uh, you know, uh, non-gravitational heating processes, you expect the entropy to behave uh, roughly as, um, as this power law that's plotted here. Um, and so you see that uh, in certain cases, like over here, the entropy flattens with respect to this power law. Uh, and most of the flattening with respect to this power law at very large radii, most of the flattening happens along the short axis, the least disturbed axis, the axis where there is no merging. Um, okay, well, Perseus isn't actually special necessarily in this respect. This kind of flattening with respect to that power law has been seen in just about uh, any uh, cluster that's been observed with Suzaku to date. So here you see a compilation of these uh, entropy profiles. And so the question is, what actually causes the entropy to flatten? And there have been several explanations proposed. Some people said, well, the temperature is actually too low because you're measuring just the electron temperature and the electron and ion, uh, the electrons and ions are not in equilibrium. Other people have said, uh, well, if you have relaxed cool core clusters, the accretion shock uh, is going to get weaker as the cluster gets older and that makes the entropy profile to dive down. Uh, and the other explanation is, uh, if, uh, if the density here is not homogeneous, then you're not measuring the right density from the x-rays, uh, and that will cause the entropy to do the same thing. So the question is, are we measuring the wrong temperature, are we measuring the wrong density, or are we measuring the wrong both of those? Uh, so what we can do to answer this question is we have an expectation for the entropy, like this, that I've already uh, shown you, but we also have an expectation for the pressure. And this comes from numerical simulations, and this has been confirmed actually with SZ observations. Okay, so we expect the pressure to follow such a profile. We can take the entropy and the pressure and we can solve for temperature and density, and we can compare these to the values that we observed. And here's what you get. Uh, so on this side, you see temperature divided by the expectation. Uh, and you see that in most cases, maybe with the ex exception of this guy over here, but in most cases, uh, you actually get a pretty good agreement between the temperature and what you'd expect to get. And certainly the temperature scatters both above and below the expectation at large radii. However, for the density, you see that at large radii, in ev at yeah, along every single arm, the density is too high compared to what you'd expect it to be. And so the, uh, the conclusion that we reach is the most natural explanation for why the entropy dives down compared to uh, uh, the expected power law profile uh, is the fact that uh, you have clumping, basically. So the density is not homogeneous. What we measure from x-rays is the average of n squared, and that happens to be bigger than the average of n everything squared um, if the gas is not uniform. So that's all that you need to invoke in order to bring both the entropy and the pressure in agreement with what you think they should be. Uh, and the clumping is bigger along the minor axis uh, based on this plot, which is actually surprising because you should have most of the stuff that's falling into the cluster, most of that should be happening along the major axis. So this is a little bit of a puzzle. The puzzle gets a little bit worse if we look at the coma cluster. So here again, I showed the expectation for the entropy, the expectation for the pressure, uh, it's a big mess inside, so where you have also the radio halo, so we know the cluster is disturbed. Uh, but here at large radii, you actually have quite a good agreement between the entropy uh, and the model and the pressure and the model. And so it seems that there's not really any clumping in at least away from the southwestern merger in the coma cluster. Uh, and so the uh, natural uh, sort of hypothesis that is just really a wild speculation on my part uh, is, 
Well, we see clumps along the short axis in Perseus, not along the merging axis, and in a sort of more dynamically active uh, cluster like Homa, uh, we see clumps uh, basically uh, not being there. And so are the clumps destroyed if you have more motions? Like along the long axis, you have more things falling in. There, the motions, the gas motions are stronger, uh, and so that destroys your clumps. Again, very wild speculation. Uh, so that brings me to the last slide, which is uh, what I would like to talk to you about at KIPAC 20. Uh, and so I hope that by then we will sort of figure out how viscous really is the intracluster medium. Uh, and what will be a great help is going to be the launch of Astro H, hopefully, which will be able to, with which we will be able to measure actually the turbulence and finally nail this question down. Uh, what are the clumps? How big are they? How do they get produced? How do, get, do they get destroyed? Uh, I think both from observations and simulations, we can attack this question much more than we already have. Uh, will we see accretion shocks near the virial radius? So also going further with the X-ray data, uh, will we actually see shocks in X-rays? Will we see them uh, in a radio with low far? And uh, this is something for the Friday session. Uh, at what, what radii should we really be using where the clusters are the most self-similar? What's the best thing to do in order to get the most precise estimates uh, for cosmology. And with that, thank you very much, and I'm very happy to take questions. So you see the uh, uh, entropy profile has a turn around the viral radius. Is, uh, how, uh, my question is uh, how you trust your viral radius. Is it possible uh, the radius where you see the turn is uh, the actual viral radius, where you see gravitational shock? Um, so we've just, we've done uh, mass modeling of the Perseus cluster. Uh, I just fitted an NFW model uh, to the thermodynamic profiles, and that's where the, the radius comes from. I, this is really, I mean, this is log scale. Um, but the difference between here and there is really huge. Uh, so I, I really don't think that any method you use, I don't think that you are likely to get your virial radius so badly off, uh, right? That, that you, you think the, ra the virial radius is here while it's actually there. This is a really big difference. Uh, this here is much closer to our 500 than anything else. You mentioned that you get a, uh, you have the clumping, so the density uh, fluctuates, but you said uh, there's no bias in the temperature. Now, my recollection is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the pressure was constant. And so, uh, therefore, uh, is it possible for you to try to uh, use higher resolution, that is, to focus on the regions where the clumps are and actually uh, pull out what the uh, uh, temperature in the clump is as opposed to the temperature in the surrounding medium? Uh, yes and no. So I, you can't really do that with Suzaku because the spatial resolution wouldn't allow you to, to do that. Um, there's a uh, uh, X-ray visionary project with Chandra on Abel 133, um, which I'm not involved in, but they have seen, actually, they have detected several clumps uh, near the virial radius. Uh, and so I think because with Chandra, you can't see uh, basically the underlying cluster, but the clumps will just peek out uh, because they're much brighter than the rest. Um, and so I think potentially with that data set, uh, they might be able to address that problem, but there's, those results are not yet published.